Hi everyone, welcome back again to the Data Idol Summer School and welcome back um, to all of our community. Um, I'm Adam, I'm a technical recruiter at Data Idols. Um, just to give you an overview, again, the Summer School is a pilot event uh, or pilot programme uh, in partnership with the Data Science Festival. It's going to run live for three months um, so you can learn in real time uh, and pick up new skills from the comfort of your own home. These sessions are designed at uh, introductory level, ideal for people who are transitioning into data or for those starting their career. Um, you can all get involved with the Slack channel. Um, so if you're watching this session, uh, you can chat live to other attendees and we'll put that, uh, that, that link into, uh, into, into the chat very soon. Uh, the Data Idols channel will be Data Idols SS um, for any event related questions. I'd also like to say a big thank you to all of our partners um, who have made this event a success uh, and also to the team who have put in a huge 400 hours uh, into making the, the summer school a reality. Um, all sessions are going to be recorded and um, so you can watch them back at a later date um, starting in September. Uh, you'll get an email link to watch the sessions back on September the 1st uh, and they'll be free to watch. So if you miss anything uh, and you want to learn at your own pace, it will be available at that time. Um, so today's session is an introduction to databases um, with Uyi from Work Your Data. Uh, enjoy the session. Thanks very much. <music> Good afternoon. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the introduction to databases. So this course is not intended to be technical. It's more of, a, of an entry point. So if you're interested in learning about databases, it will give you a foundation that will actually let any technical course that will give you a deeper understanding of any technical course you are studying. So if you are learning to program databases, if you are learning to use database tools, this will give you an underlying understanding that will make those things more intuitive and easier to use. Okay, so we'll be talking about how databases work. Now, the, the first thing, so first we'll go over some general concepts like, when any application is being built, basically, one thing that's important to understand, but not always obvious, is that what the developer is doing is, is taking a task that a human being would do, cutting it into very small pieces, and then getting the computer to do those quickly. So what we are going to be doing when we are analyzing the databases is we are going to be looking at the tasks human beings do in real world databases. So, the example we would use is actually to say an example of somebody working in a bank in the 1960s. So this is before databases exist. So now the structure of a database, what's the structure of a database? Imagine we are a bank worker in 1960s and somebody comes in to a new customer comes in and they want to become a customer for the bank. What we'll do is we'll give them a form to fill. That form will be made up of different fields of information that they put in. And then once they finish filling that form, we'll put that into a filing cabinet. And then we will that filing cabinet will be of all the customer records of all the other customers we have. And then we'll put that into a storage area with all our other records. So you have our customer records, you have our account records. Now, these actually reflect the structure of a database. If you look at the form, is the customer record. It contains all the information on that customer. The fields on the form are the data fields. So this is where each piece of information, where that all the information is broken down to individual pieces of information. The filing cabinet is the data set. So it's lots of copies of the same information, but for different customers, of the same type of information, but for different customers. 
So that'll be the data set of the table. And the collection of filing cabinets is actually our database. So we can see this same structure again, just in an example. So this is a table which we might see on a spreadsheet or if we use databases, this is the kind of results we'll get returned. When we look at it, each line is a record. Now, if you think of the form, basically each of these is the data that would have been stored on the form. The full form will have all this information, name, address, town, date of birth. Then each column is a field. So each of those fields we circle, like one of those fields would have been first name, another field would have been surname. So each of this, each cell is a field on that form. The whole set is the data set or table. So that's the filing cabinet, because these are the multiple records that we've stored in that filing cabinet. And then the database itself, which is a bit harder to show in the diagram, is going to be the is going to be the collection of filing cabinets. We have lots of different tables connected together. So this gives this is just a high level background. We'll, we'll be digging next into how all these pieces work or how they are brought together to work in modern databases. But first, before we get there, we need to cover something. Again, there's something general about computing and that is data types. So as a human being, when you read a form, if we have the, if you get the customer form and you read it, you will see date of birth. You know what that is, you know that's a date. You will see name. You know that that's a string of numbers, a string of letters and you know be able to read that to the person's name. If you see address and there's a number there, you know that that's a number on the streets and that's an address. But if you see age and a number, you know that that's a different type of number. And for instance, if you see phone number, phone number is a lot of numbers, but you can't do mathematics on it. The computer doesn't know these things. The computer has to be told exactly what type of data each each field contains. So, and this has, this has implications on how we design databases. So first we'll quickly go through the types. One is the whole number. So this is an integer, one, two, three, um, 2, 346,532. Basically any whole number, it doesn't include fractions and it can get as big as you like really. Now, the thing about whole numbers is that's the computer's natural language. So you may have heard that computers work in zeros and ones. These zeros and ones are just a way of representing all numbers. So anything that's a whole number, the computer processes really quickly. The next set is we have fractions, decimals, fractions, 14 point numbers. Now the computer represents this using multiple whole numbers. So it might have a number for the a number for the whole part and a number for the fraction part. Sometimes it has a single long number and then it has another number that shows where the decimal point is. Because the computer doesn't instinctively understand this, this has to be encoded somehow. So that's how it codes it, multiple numbers. The next one, I'm not going to go too deep into exactly how these work, but as I said, it's just, it's useful to have this general idea whenever you're studying or whatever tool you're using. So next one is a string. A string is just, is a collection of text. Computers really naturally don't have any, any way of understanding text. They only understand numbers. So what we actually do is we take every letter, oh, this is done behind the scenes in programming. Every letter is encoded as a number. So you can see some examples here. And you can see that even numbers, so like, like the number in a telephone number, that's not a mathematical number, that's actually a string. So even the numbers are encoded. So number two, for instance, would be encoded as 50, which is because, so you have to tell the computer that this phone number is a string, it's not a number. So it knows and it encodes it properly. And finally, there's dates. Now, the main issue with dates is there is 
they are all represented very differently in different software. And so you have to understand how your own software re um, represents dates. Sometimes you are loading up a file, the date format will be different. The months may come before the day, the year may come first, everything gets swapped around. So whenever you are developing anything that uses dates, you need to be very careful about how it comes across and structure. The main thing to take away at this stage, at this introductory stage, is that anything you're doing that is involving a whole number will run much faster than exactly the same thing using any of these other data types, whether it's a string, a date, or a fraction. So that's something to keep in mind, especially when, like nowadays, you can have a database that's running tens of millions of records per day, even per hour, and you need it to run as quickly as possible. So as much as possible, you want to arrange your data so that the process is reliant on those whole numbers rather than any of these other data types. So I think that's as technical as it's going to get. Now we're going to go into the structure of the database. So first question, like, like we said, the computer only does what a human being does, broken down into simple steps and much faster. So what do we usually want to do from database? Again, imagine we're at the bank, what you want to do, a customer comes in, want to be able to get their data and store it. Then maybe we need to make a decision to give them an overdraft or to set up a signing order for them. We need to be able to find that data. So we need to be able to go into the database, find that customer's data, pull it out. Then we need to be able to make those changes to add or edit data, which is to say, okay, we are adding this standing order there, or we are canceling this bill or whatever we need to do to that data set. And then we also want to be able to perform calculations on our data. We might want to say, oh, how many of our customers are students? Oh, how, many, how much money did we get this month from a certain group of customers? So this is in general, these are the things that we want to do. So we'll go straight into, we'll talk immediately about storing data because that's actually relatively straightforward. To store data, what does that involve? The customer comes, they give you the form, they fill out the form, they give it to you. You put it in a file folder and you put it on top of your stack of files. That's it. That's really easy. At least it seems really easy. It seems really easy until we get to finding data. So now the customer has given you a form, we filled it out, we've put it on our stack of files. We have something like that. We just put the newest file on top. Now imagine we now want to find, another customer comes in and wants to do something. So we need to find their file. We have all these files stacked this way. So how do we now find that customer's data? In order to find that customer's data, we'll need to open every single file, check, is this the customer's file? No, go to the next one, is this the customer's file? We'll have to go through, and it's possible that that customer will be the last customer in the file. So we'll have to go through every single file to find their data which makes that, which is basically going to take a huge amount of time, very inefficient. So what do we do instead? What we need to do is we need to arrange the data. And again, when you talk about it as a, as human, as a bank or as a human being, this is obvious because I'm sure a lot of us will know about filing cabinets where all the files are arranged by name. Maybe you go to your GP or something and they'll ask for your name, they go into the cabinets, they flick through because it's all arranged in alphabetical order. The benefit of organizing that data is that you, once you know the person's name, you know roughly, you don't know exactly where the person's file will be, but you know roughly, you know that, okay, he's with the J's, it's with the uh, P's, and it's going to be, if it's a Peter, you know that's going to be after Patricia. So it's much, much quicker to find the file. In order to do this though, that means we need to change the way we store the data. Instead of storing the data by simply putting one file on top of the other, we need to store the data by inserting each file into its correct place in the model. So the key we use 
what we use to organize the data is called a primary key. So if we have all the files stored by customer names, that customer name is the primary key. So whenever we insert data, whenever we add new data, we need to put it in the correct place based on that primary key. And when we are searching through the data, we can search through based on primary key. That may seem to solve the problem. And that solves the problem of find, us finding data for a single customer, for instance. But there's a more complicated level. What if we say we want to find all the students in our records? Then all the data is organized using a primary key. So, but that primary key is name. If we now want to find all the students, we need to still go through every single file, pick up Aaron Adamson and see, is he a student? No. We'll pick up Aaron Benedict and is he a student? Yes. So we still need to go through all the files. So this, using this organized model with a primary key, helps us find a certain type of data quickly, but there are other types of data which we can't find as fast. But then some of you may now be thinking, based on this structure, I have an idea what the solution will be. The solution is indexes. An index is very similar to what you do, is what you have in a library. So if you go to a library, all the books are arranged in either in alphabetical order by it. They're arranged by title first, and then they're arranged by author usually, and then, sorry, they're arranged by subject, then by author, then by title. So that would be a complex primary key. But what if I'm looking for a book based on some information in it? For instance, uh, a fantasy book where they mention that contains monsters. So there might be a fantasy section, but not all the fantasy books contain monsters. So what will happen is the library will have an index. An index is, is basically a set, a set of cards. It's a different filing cabinet, actually. It's a whole filing cabinet and so on. But it only contains two pieces of information. It contains what you're arranging it by, like type of animal involved. And say, so, OK, I'm looking for a monster, monster shark. So. It will, the index will be arranged by type of animal. You pull out the monster shark card, and there it will have the names of all the books using the proper primary key. So the names of all the books and where you can find them that contain monster sharks. So coming back to our example of the bank with the students, bank looking for students, you, can, you will have a filing cabinet which will be your index. In that index, it will say, maybe occupation. So you have all, all, the, all your information that you have on your customers will be rearranged in this filing cabinet. We just do two pieces of information. It will have the occupation and the name. So you go to occupation student, you pull that out, and it will have a link to exactly where, it will have the name of the person, which will tell you exactly where in the mailing, sets of filing cabinets, you can find that person's name or all those people's names. So basically an index is a smaller filing cabinet that tells you where you can find your full data, your full set of data. Now the next, next thing we need to do, so, with the current structure we have so far, we have a set of we have a set of data that is organized by a primary key, which means that as long as we have that primary key, we can easily find the data. We have a set of indexes which are built on different topics, different pieces of information, which help us to find our data in the main filing cabinet more easily because we have all those filing cabinets to search through. So that makes finding data much faster. And one thing to keep in mind is because the index is a second cabinet, it also takes up more space. So we have the main filing cabinet and the index filing cabinet, which takes up more space, but the index filing cabinet is much smaller 
because it only contains those two pieces of information. So what we're doing is we're exchanging space for speed. So we're we are getting some more space for this small filing cabinet, which makes us incredibly faster at finding information in our big filing cabinet area. This exchange of space for speed is something that happens a lot in databases, especially as space becomes much cheaper and data becomes much bigger. Now, the next thing we're going to look at is, is units of data. So this is, so if we look at the, if we first of all take our original form that the um, client filled out, let's say as part of the form, we collect information on where they, where they work. And we want to know in general, what type of, the name of the company, we want to know what type of company it is roughly, roughly what size of staff it has, and maybe how many years it has been in business. This is just for us to do things like say, oh, we want to provide some a line of overdraft to our customers. So we want to know how much we can afford to give them, how much we can give them that won't be too much for them to pay back. So in getting this information on each form, each person will fill it out and say, oh, I work at Tesco. So how big is Tesco? Uh, it has, I don't know, over 100,000 staff. Um, how long has it been in business? Over 30 years. The second person will come and say, oh, I work at Tesco. It has over 500,000 staff. It's really big. It's been in business, so definitely over 15 years. It's the same company, but different people are giving different information. This happens a lot for different reasons. One is like in this example, we can't expect every staff of Tesco to know exactly how many staff they have. And while they will have an idea, it won't be exact. And they may not know the history of the company of ex exactly how long it's been in business. So what that means is on all these people forms, you have different information about Tesco. Now, if we are diligent, we might actually go and find out the correct information about Tesco ourselves. We want to find out that information. How do we correct it? It means we need to now go through every single customer form and update. Actually, Tesco has 200,000 staff. Actually, Tesco has been in business for over 150 years. So, and we have to do that over and over and over again. And all it takes is one customer to come in and fill a new form and our information is incomplete or inaccurate again. So instead, how do we do that? What we'll do is when we get to full form, instead of putting the organization information on the same form as the client's information, we will identify that that organization is actually a different entity from the client. So when we say entity, that's just a fancy word for it, it's a different thing. The client is one thing, the organization is a different thing. And so we want to keep the information of the organization separate and then we'll keep the information of the client separate. So on the, on the client side, we'll ask the client, what organization do you work for? They'll say, we work for Tesco. We'll go through our list. Oh, Tesco is company 522. So on the client form, we'll just say he works for company 522. We'll now have a different set of records for all our companies. And we'll say company 522, that's Tesco. Tesco has this amount of staff. Tesco has been in business for this amount of years. And we can keep that one piece of information up to date. We can keep it accurate. It prevents duplication and it reduces the amount of data that we need to store because instead of storing hundreds of copies for all our, all our clients that work in Tesco, we just have to store that one copy once somewhere. So what that looks like will be on the form, we only have that single record. We only have that single entry, um, company 522. Then we'll now have a smaller cabinet somewhere else, which will now have the company records. 
where the employer details are. Um, you may be noticing at this stage that we are getting a lot of cabinets. And yes, this is actually what's why databases end up with a lot of tables, because what you are doing is you are taking a big piece of complex information, breaking it into these entities, into these things, and keeping information for each thing separately. And then all you need to do is link them. All you need to do is say, this person is linked to that company. This person is linked to that school. This person is linked to that address. That act of splitting the data down is called normalization. And the link that we have in the main data set to the smaller data set is called the foreign key. So by this, I mean that's ID 522. In the company filing cabinet, that's the primary key because 522 is what you use to organize all your companies. So the number is what you use to organize all your companies. But on the client side, it's just a code, it's just a key. So that foreign key will point to the primary key of the main data set. So this is an example of what it can look like in an actual database. Uh, this is just a sample Microsoft database. So here, this is the orders table. This table contains information on each order that's made, how much it costs, um, who made the order, who the customer was, who the employee was. You can see here that in the main table, it has order information and a lot of other information that relates specifically to the order. The customer information sits in a different table and that's now linked. And so you can have one cost, this, what this relationship is telling you, is saying this one here and that's an infinity symbol there. What it's saying is you can have one customer can make many orders. So instead of repeating that customer's details on every order they make, we just have that customer's information in one place. And these are all the orders they've made. The same way one employee can serve many orders. So again, instead of having the employee's details over and over and over in the orders table, we just have one employee linking to the orders table. We have the shippers table, we have the tax status table. Basically, we've, separate, we've taken an order and separated it out into all the, real, all the things that make up that order, all the entities that make up that order. And we've split out those entities. Something to keep in mind is this splitting out of entities is, can be done at a different level depending on the business or the, depending on the user, basically. So every company will have a different level of information that's useful to it. And based on that information, like for instance, in, this, in the case of this order, it's, they're keeping a lot of customer information, their email address, their phone numbers, their home address, job title. If you need all this information, then it definitely makes sense to split it out. In some cases though, you might actually not care, like this tax status, for instance, it's just a single field, depending on the business, it might not be worth splitting that out to a whole different entity. The different ways we can apply this, when we're applying this normalization, is dependent on what database, what we are using that database for. Now, what we've described here, this process of splitting out the entities from the main information and maintaining them differently, that's called normalization. And that is what we end up with is called the relational database. It's um, sometimes referred to as RDBMS. So if you are reading up on databases, you might see that phrase a lot, RDBMS. It's when you break the, when you can take data, break it into these pieces, and then you relate them to each other. So these lines connecting them are called relationships. So most databases actually 
have this structure. And this scale of being able to take data, index it properly, pull out the entities is like the, is the core level of how most databases work. But what has now happened, because as data, the size of data increases and the speed of computing increases and the amount of space available increases, this structure has been expanded in different ways. So one example is cubes, analytics cubes. Now, an analytics cubes takes that idea of normalization of pulling out entities and goes even further. So it asks the question, what's the real question a database is trying to answer? And with analytics cubes, the real question, they are coming down to that calculation. That's um, calculating data, processing data. And so the, the questions they're trying to answer is how many and how much? So for instance, we will have, looking at the shopping example, we will have, okay, if you're storing my, the, number you're studying is the amount you spent. How much have we spent buying something? And how much have we got back from that? So that's the core piece of information. So what an analytics cube does is it takes normalization further out. It says the only information we are going to store in our main cabinet is the amount spent information. And then in our other cabinets, we'll now have information like the date it was spent, the departments that spent it, the item it was spent on, the authorizer, who authorized it. What they now do, because this central cabinet only has amounts, and remember what we said that the computer works very well with numbers. So the computer can perform a lot of calculations on those amounts. And then you viewing it can just say, oh, I want to take all those numbers, split it by department name and date, date. And the computer will instantly give you the answer. Instantly give you the answer because it's able to do that calculation super quickly. So this is called an analytics cube. This is also maybe referred to as OLAP, which is online analytics processing. I may be translating that wrongly, but it's also called OLAP cubes. This is usually how data warehouses are designed. So the difference between the data warehouse and a relational database is that they've usually been split further to get to this level. Then there's a further level, which I won't really go to for fine to because that's getting very technical but there are other systems that may take each column. So if you have a data set that has lots of columns, because the way relational database works, each time you ask for a record, it gets the whole record. So if you've got like a hundred columns in a record, pulling out that whole record is a huge amount of, is a significant amount of data, a significant amount of time. So you have column store databases where you specifically ask for the columns you want. So they never pull out the whole record. So those are called column store databases. Um, but I said that's getting very technical and this is just introductory. So we'll leave it at this. Then the next thing, the next piece that's you will encounter a lot, even when you're just starting, is structured data formats. Now this really, I'm not about the database itself. So we've been able to get our data, um, organize it, normalize it. So we now have all these tables. What now happens is when one system wants to send data to a different system. So maybe you have your accounting system that wants to send data to your human resources system, but they have totally different databases. They need a way to communicate with each other. What they do 
is they send, they have to structure the data. So there are data formats that have been agreed between all these different systems um, where, how they can send that data. Those data sets are JSON and XML. What they are really doing, again, we're not gonna get technical. I'm saying that a lot because this is an introductory course and because there's a lot technical to get into. But JSON and XML, what they're effectively doing is they're taking all those data from all those different tables and they're building it back into that initial user form that we had. So this initial form, which has all the data from different places of different things, maybe you have your last five addresses, maybe you have the last three companies you worked for, it's all there. So what these structured data formats are trying to do is to pick up that data from all these different filing cabinets, put them back together and send them as a single form so that the, the software on the other side can now pick up that form break it apart again and put it in its own filing cabinet using its own storage. And yeah, so th this is something that you experience if you are using web APIs, which is a web API is simply a lot of soft, a lot of online software right now, software as a service, they contain your data on the web. And what they say is if you want to get the data, you can request that data over the web. So when you request that data, you'll be getting it in usually JSON or XML. Well, nowadays JSON is really popular. So you'll be getting it in one of these structured data formats. And that's it. That's really, we've covered how databases are designed. We've covered, what they do, how to structure them, and different variations, and how they communicate with each other. Now, if you are doing this course, I assume that at some point, you are going to be developing databases. So as a developer, there's something you need to keep in mind, which is what's, which is called, I call it the box of oranges, which is that a lot of times as engineers, we do things very technically. We, we end up getting very technical. We end up we understand all the code. We understand that, oh, this bit may need to be in exactly this format to work here. So we focus on building the engine, like building the engine of a car without thinking of the driver experience. So however, we need to remember that our users are not engineers. And so the box of orange juice is literally a box of orange juice. Like if you look at this, this was built by an engineer. It was designed so that it can fall flat. You can, they can pack hundreds of it in a box that when it's full, it can hold the weight of the orange juice. It can has its protective seal and it's designed to do a lot. But when you want to drink orange juice, you don't have to know anything about that. You just pick the box, you open it, you look at it, you can tell how to, even if this is your first time, you'll be able to tell how to open it and it just pours normally. And you don't care about how much engineering has gone into that. So when you build databases for somebody, it's the same way. They shouldn't have to care about how technical it is or all the engineering that's gone into it. It should just work like a box of oranges. Thank you. Cheers. Mm -hmm.